In this video, I will explain Chapter 2, Elements of Financial Risk Management book of Peter Christofferson. So this book deals with two important issues. Basically, is historical simulation, that's a technique to compute value at risk, and expected shortfall, that's a technique to also compute risk in the industry. So the overview. In this chapter, we'll basically see a methodology to compute value at risk, and namely, that is, historical simulation. Uh, if you remember, that's the model used by JP Morgan to compute the risk. We'll discuss the pros and cons of using the value at risk measure, and then we will introduce expected shortfall as an alternative to value at risk. How do we define historical simulation? Actually, it's pretty easy. We take past returns. So in this formula, you will see that this RPF, these are the returns of the portfolio that go from tau equals 1 to m. Since this is minus tau here, it's basically the past m returns. So if we have one year, it would be 250 returns. If we have 10 years, it would be 2,500 returns and so on. So here, basically, the idea is we have a certain percentile. So in this case, 100p. So p can be 1% or 5%. The regulatory p, it would be 1%. So it would be 100p, 1%, and then we take percentile of all these returns at the 1% level. So if we have 250, that would be about three returns. So the lower third return, that would be the value at risk in this case. In this case, we're defining value at risk in percent terms. Very quick, the pros of using historical simulation is that it's very easy uh, to implement and it's model free in nature. We don't need any model to basically compute value at risk in this case. Well, the cons is it relies on past history, and it has no model, so the people some people don't like it because of that. Another problem is we don't know how large M should be. So whether we take one year, two years, or five years, uh, J.P. Morgan uses one year of historical data. Royal Bank of Canada uses two years of data. So basically, there's no saying about how to take it. In this graph we see the comparison of value at risk historical simulation computed with 250 days and with 1000 days. So we see the one the 1000 day reacts much slower to changes in the market than the 250 day. So this is for the crisis in 2008 and 250 day reacts much quickly than the 1000 day. A variation of historical simulation is the weighted historical simulation. So in the weighted historical simulation we're going to apply a weight to the more recent returns so that they have more weight in the whole function. Uh, in the regular historical simulation all the returns of all the whatever 250 or 1000 returns have exactly the same weight. And here at the bottom we have the weighting function. So each return is going to be weighted by this depending on whether tau equals 1 or tau equals m. So for the more recent returns, tau equals 1, the weight is going to be very large and for the ones like that are m days apart, that would be 250 or 1000 days, then the weight is going to be much lower. As to how do we choose the this eta that's going to be a constant, the typical values that eta takes are between 0.95 and 0.99. So if we go to the chapter 2 exercises, then we're going to have the chapter 2.1 and 2.2 questions. And in here we have a, an eta of 0.99 and the cutoff is going to be 0.01. So that's basically the value at risk at the 1% level. So in here we have tau, it starts from 250 and then it goes to basically one. So this one would be the first day and this is going to be the weight. So here is where we're applying that formula that we had before. So this is basically the formula that we're using there with an eta of 0 0.99 and then tau goes from 1 to 250. In this very particular case we're gonna use this weights to compute the value at risk for October 1st, 1987. So here is the value at risk using historical simulation. It goes from C4, C253, takes the percentile of the last 250 days, and then the J5, the percentile at which I'm taking it. So this would be the J5, that's at the 1% level. For the weighted historical simulation, we have to do a little bit more work. 
we have here the weights and then we have to match this weights to the last 250 returns. Given that we want to compute the VAR for October 1st, 1987, the last 250 returns are going to start here 250 days before. Now, when we compute the weighted historical simulation value at risk for, let's say, October 7, then the last 250 returns are going to start just this day. This is going to be the day before. Notice that the weights are not going to change. So for that, what we're going to do is we're going to copy paste each one of the series of returns, depending on what value at risk we want to compute on the right hand side. If we go here to the right hand side, I have the return and the weight. Before computing this, we first copy the weights and we paste them as values. So here, paste values. And then I go and I do exactly the same thing with the last 250 returns given that I want to compute the one for October 1st. Here I compute the ones that are long portfolio, and then I paste again as values. I want to sort now based on the return itself, but I have to also the weight. So here I go data, there you go. So here I have, this is the lowest return. So the cumulative weights here are gonna be, well, I start at 100%, then this is goes down, 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 and then before I breach the 99%, that is going to be my value at risk number. Another way of seeing it is if you add all these weights up, they add up to 1.18 here. The sum of the three weights is more than 1%. That's the reason that the value at risk for the weighted historical simulation is going to be minus 2.37. Notice that as we change from day to day, so in here, well, now we have a return of minus 2.74 that goes in. And then in this case, this adds up already to more than 1%. That's why the value at risk now is 2.74. And then let's look as we move closer to that Black Monday. Here would be the Black Monday. So the Black Monday, it's the minus 22.9%. That would be the value at risk. The main advantage of the weighted historical simulation is that the choice of M is less crucial because it dies away very fast given that the more recent weights are so much bigger than the oldest ones. Of course the cons is that they don't tell us how, how to choose ETA and if we're short the market then a market crash would have no impact on our VAR which might not be a very good thing. Now we're going to analyze that window of October 1987, that day there was a drop of 22.6% in the S&P 500 and Dow Jones. Here we have the returns, long portfolio in the S&P 500, and we have the value at risk computed with historical simulation. You can see that just for the month of October, there were one, two, three, four, and five breaches. Now, when we look at the weighted historical simulation, we see something different. We see that, well, we had those one, two, three breaches, but then after we have the crash, then value at risk just jumps up, and then we don't get any more breaches in, in the VAR. So still we get breaches, but at least this one reacts after that big crash. Now we're going to compare the historical simulation value at risk with the risk metrics. So in blue, we have the risk metrics one, and in red, we have the historical simulation. This is around the crisis of September 2008. We see that the risk matrix reacts much faster when there's that market crash and then after things calm down it goes back to low levels of value at risk whereas historical simulation takes much longer to react and then once it, it's up here in Jan 2009 it takes forever to go back down to low levels so basically a historical simulation model doesn't react fast to big changes either going up in terms of volatility or going down. Another way to see the same problem is if we go to that 2008-2009 crisis and we say, look, there's going to be a VAR limit on the trader of $100,000. So basically, he cannot go above that VAR limit of $100,000. So basically, his position is going to be totally restricted by his value at risk. In this case, we're going to use the 10-day value at risk at the 1% level.
So the position is going to be $100,000 over the 10 day value at risk. And in here, we're going to compute our PNL. So basically, how much money is he making based on that restriction he has on his position and his value at risk and the VAR limit of 100,000. So now we're going to put two graphs on what the PNL looks like given the risk metrics model and the historical simulation. Here we start at zero, so no profit, no loss, and then we compute the cumulative PNL for two traders. One trades under the risk metrics model, the other one under the historical simulation model for value at risk. During the crisis, you see, well, pretty much the same, but as the crisis unfolds on September 2008, the historical simulation model loses more money. Why? Well, because the value at risk is not reacting fast enough to the changes. Now, when things calm down, that is, after September 2008, let's say Jan 2009, then value at risk goes down, so he should be able to, and risk goes down, so he should be able to make more money. So that is true under the risk metrics model, the blue line, so that's why he starts making money. However, under the historical simulation value at risk, he's still restricted. He still has that cap that, look, you cannot invest. So then the conclusion here is, well, depending on what model you use, you might be restricting the profit and losses of your trader. So that's why choosing the proper value at risk model is going to give more power to the traders to be able to not breach the limit. The last measure that we have is the expected shortfall measure. So value at risk tells us, okay, how much money is going to be lost. So it says with 1% probability, you're going to lose more than, let's say, $100,000, as we were seeing just now. Now, the expected shortfall deals into how much are you going to lose? Like, what's the average of those losses? Because the value at risk tells you, yeah, in 1% of the time, you're going to go above your VAR. But if the VAR is $100,000, is it going to be 200,000? Is it going to be 500,000? Is it going to be 1 million? So we don't really know. Here, mathematically, how do we write this? The expected shortfall with a certain probability for t plus 1, it's equal to minus the expected value at time t of a return of your portfolio, given that that return was lower than minus the value at risk number. So it's basically an average of the losses that exceed that value at risk number with a negative sign. In the case of the normal distribution, we have that the ratio of the expected shortfall at the 1% level and the value at risk at the 1% level is equal to 15%. So go and take a closer look as to how we got to this result. This is basically saying that the expected shortfall is going to be 15% higher than the value at risk under two conditions. One, we compute this uh, two measures at the 1% level, and two, we assume that the returns are normally distributed. So this relation of 15% is under normality for returns.